Hello and welcome. What we're going to be looking at in this video is we're going to be looking at taking all the pieces of uh, Citizen Kane uh, by Orson Welles and we're going to start uh, looking at being able to analyse them and certainly looking at a few film techniques, um, a few uh, elements of note about the film which you can then start to use to form your response. So you've, um, after going through the, the various themes of the film, after going through the main ideas, then starting to I guess attach them to some various uh, filmic techniques, to uh, various aspects of the film which are important and certainly help to back up and support your response. All right, now it is a film which has uh, which was pioneering in its day, and certainly a lot of the film techniques which are used in Citizen Kane are film techniques that had never been used before, and certainly it's one that's quite influential on a lot of um, cinematic techniques that are used now, and. So when you're looking at film techniques, now a lot of them again are quite exaggerated and um, I sort of follow along with the over the top and often overstated aspects of some of the other parts of the film. So the overstated uh, themes and, and motifs, all those sorts of things, the symbols which are used in the film and certainly the techniques used to make the film are quite all overstated and, and certainly um, they bring the film quite a lot to life. Now, some of these film, film techniques are quite interesting, and one which I, I don't go through um, in this video, but one I, I like to, to sort of share with you to start with, is there was one technique which wasn't really um, mastered to a number of years later, which was able to actually film crowd scenes, when there are, are a number of crowd scenes in the film, with only a, a, a small num number of people. Now, before, if you wanted to shoot those sorts of crowd scenes, you had to get thousands of extras to come in. Whereas Wells was able to pioneer a technique where you could actually film 20 people over and over again and um, be able to sort of um, piece them together in the sense that you would get them to appear like they're one big crowd. And this is one technique which is used quite frequently today and certainly a lot of the crowd shots that you will see in a lot in films are usually a handful of people who are repeated over and over again. Um, and it's also a film... Uh, when you're looking at which places an emphasis on characterization and certainly the characters in this film are quite strong and we'll go through some different things about that later um, and it uses narrative as a mean of showing development and contrast rather than using a linear style so I, I should explain that what that means is essentially because it uses flashbacks and it uses uh, testimonies from various characters in the film what it does is it helps to show a contrast between Cain in his younger years and Cain in his much older years. And even though it does sort of still follow a linear style and that the flashbacks are in order from, I guess, from, from the beginning of his life to the end, um, they, don't, uh, they don't sort of reflect linear style in the sense that we sort of um, can see a jump from his older so, sorry, his younger self to his older self, and certainly we also see that through the makeup and special effects, particularly which are used on on Wells's face as he is playing the main character. Now, let's look at the, some camera techniques to start with, and certainly, as I mentioned before, it uses a couple of um, techniques over again, and some which are quite um, important for the film. Now, the most important technique that this um, film sort of pioneered, or was the first time it was used for a major film anyway, was deep focus. Where basically foreground and background. Uh, were in focus at the same time and one that helped to sort of show space and particularly the isolation of Kane. It was a technique which required a lot of effort to put together and certainly normally when you film something you'll have something in the foreground which is in focus and then the background which is out of focus whereas um, through the, the lenses and the lighting which have been used for this film it was possible to have them both in focus at the same time and this certainly helps to um, have different characters play more of a role and certainly in some of the um, images that you see in the film you see a great great examples of this focus being used. High and low shots are used quite often as this is a film about power and certainly a film about Kane's power so we often get like this shot on my right here uh, you do get a lot of shots which um, do indicate power and certainly um, not only the power of Kane but also the power of other people and in the, the film as well and certainly the way that they they sort of try and uh, exert themselves over others so high and low shots of some uh, some of the shots should I say that are quite common in the film and certainly ones you'll come across quite a lot uh, and unique angles are also something which are quite important to film it was a film that experimented a lot with camera and certainly a lot with um, 
sort of crane shots and some which move from a really long wide shot really up close up to a close up shot so it was a film that used uh, particularly crane shots in a number of different ways and certainly it helps to sort of um, show different ideas and certainly have to look at so particularly some of the ones which move from very long to a close up shot you sort of have to look at what it is framing and why it is important to the film that those things are framed so, f- for instance, one of the scenes I'm thinking of is um, the scene where Kane is giving his uh, election speech, or his candidacy speech, should I say. And it sort of starts from a wide shot to show how many people are sort of fanatically following him, a- up to a close shot where we start to see the man exerting his power, exerting his wit, all those sorts of things. So that, that camera shot really helps to show this, um, this transition quite well. We also get quite a bit of framing in these characters, and certainly the distance between characters is quite often used. And the way that these these camera shots are framed is it's like it likes to show um, the intimacy of the characters, and certainly it helps the characterizations um, sort of grow a little bit beyond what they just are in terms of um, purely an acting sense. And so when we're looking at um, what Citizen Kane offers in terms of being a film about character, a lot of it has to be um, has to do, should I say, with the way that the camera is framed and the way that the shots are all framed. Okay, let's move on. Flashback is obviously another technique uh, that you're going to be looking at uh, quite extensively when you're looking at the film Citizen Kane, as it is entitled pretty much entirely through flashbacks, and it does. It's one of those films that starts with the end, and it starts, as I said, with his childhood, and then sort of moves on towards the end of his life. The technique also makes use of multiple narrators, and it's certainly through um, the flashbacks that the multiple narrators come into an effect, where by interviewing all these people who had a role in Kane's life, we start to discover new perspectives about him, and certainly we uncover more about him um, through these other people than if we were just to follow Kane on, on our own. And it gives basically... Um, a, a way for him not to completely dominate as a character and so not every shot is filled with the side of Kane doing what he does best. So by telling the story through flashbacks we start to see different sides of him, we start to um, take different um, veneers and different covers off him to sort of see what lies underneath and certainly through um, a lot of these portraits that are painted of him by different people uh, we start to really uncover the true him as opposed to probably his public persona which is very brash and arrogant and doesn't really appear to um, be phased by anything when quite clearly he is. Um, A technique also allows the story to be broken up and uh, clearly shows particularly uh, Kane's age progression, certainly that transition and contrast between his younger years and certainly also his much older years. So when you have a look at those sorts of things in depth, the flashback techniques which are used are used to effect. They're not just um, placed together as a way of telling a story. They're a way of telling the story with the effect that the director and certainly um, those involved with the production of the film wanted uh, the film to come across as. Okay, let's move on to characters. Now, the characters are quite unique in this film in that pretty much all of them were stage actors. They weren't um, screen actors. And this ties in... Uh, with a couple of key ideas in the film. First of all, they are large and life sort of characters in which screen um, actors were very used to looking good on camera but weren't able to project themselves in such a way that a stage actor was. And also that all of these actors knew each other quite well. They were part of the Mer- Mercury Theatre Company who, and had worked together quite extensively before. So there was already quite a rapport between the various actors and so they were able to form more, I guess, natural relationships with each other than probably what they would have otherwise if they were just an ensemble cast which they just saw through together. Um, They were also much better suited to this deep focus technique because it sort of matches the depth of a stage and that even on a stage you get a foreground, a middle ground and a background. And so um, by being used to the various positions they have on the stage, they could um, be far more, I guess, uh, suited to being in multiple places and still having to to play a role on camera and certainly they they're able to make use of that extra space that they get through deep focus certainly a lot of the films at the time and i guess a lot of films still are were a lot about close-up shots and certainly actors had to be very very good at playing close-up shots whereas 
in this case, they were um, made to do sort of close-up types of scenes from a number of different um, distances away. And certainly it gives their personas much greater presence than by just giving them a close-up shot every now and again to show their reactions to things. And certainly it's a technique that sort of really did persist for quite a long time. And certainly now we start to see a bit more of an organic sense of filmmaking and acting. And this is why, of course, now a lot of actors do um, come from the stage and the screen and vice versa. They sort of jump back and forth again. All right. And they're also able to project themselves far more dynamically in that they're able to convey a greater level of emotional depth, as I sort of mentioned before, in conjunction with the style of film. So as I said, but the fact that they had worked together before, but also because they were stage actors used to projecting their voice, and particularly because of its, it's, uh, if you're performing a, a play in front of a large audience, you have to be used to being able to project your personality from a distance. And this is something which is quite unique to the stage actor especially because you want people in the back row to be able to, to see that you're upset and all these sorts of things. And so in the film, they're able to sort of show off their personality from a, a, a wider distance from the camera. Now, while one may sort of argue that this sort of makes the film a little bit pantomime in the sense that it becomes more like a, a stage play that's been filmed rather than a film, it's done so also in a way where you can sort of see various film elements blending in with it. And so even though it is sort of criticised for that a little bit, um, and certainly being over the top as it is, it still is something that works quite, quite well, especially for this film. And seeing as Kane is an over-the-top kind of character, and Orson Welles is an over-the-top kind of filmmaker, it fits quite well. Now, symbols and contrasts are, are, idea, are things which are used quite frequently in the film, and certainly... Um, having everything and nothing being a prominent idea in a film is a strong um, indicator for why these various symbols and contrasts are, are quite important. Certainly the contrast between the young and old Kane, um, his public persona and his uh, private persona, um, the various symbols such as the, sl the snow globe and the, um, the sled which are used in the film. All these sorts of things, having the world in one's hands, certainly uh, really reinforce a lot of the key ideas of the film and certainly when you're discussing um, what role the, the contrasts and symbols of this film have, you'll be discussing it in regards to that. Now the snow globe for instance is one such symbol and to have it smashed has all suggests the nature of Kane's power and that he has all this, um, this power and yet almost himself he has the world in his hand and he smashes it because of the fact that he is miserable. He can't control everything and um, to have this device at the beginning of the film sort of indicates this, this world of his is collapsing on itself and it's mostly because of him. We also get this idea of it in Xanadu, for instance, and it's opulent and yet it's also still unfinished and it sort of makes a very uh, a, a, a s smart sort of suggestion about the American dream and that it's always about wanting more and never being satisfied with having it. And that's basically what we get with Xanadu. We get something that which is almost bigger than Buckingham Palace, and yet it is still unfinished. He still wants to add more to it and make it bigger and grander and that sort of thing. And even when it closes its door, it seems like this big empty shell of what the American Dream bought. But yet it wasn't a home at all. It was a big mansion with stuff in it. And that's basically the way that Kane looks at it. And so... The use of location and setting also reinforces this method of characterization, and particularly that of Kane. So the house represents his character. There's this big, grand, um, over-the-top sort of husk, which is filled with nothing inside, nothing of value, nothing of worth. And certainly it, it reflects Kane's character as much as it does anything else. And certainly all these contrasts and symbols, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, have an effect of being able to establish the kind of character that Kane is. Now, what do we know about Charles Foster Kane? Now, this is something where, because this film is primarily centred around him and certainly about the man, his mystique and his power, um, there is a still a certain enigma to him and there, this is also represented in very, very symbolic ways, not least of which is the image to my right there and certainly that scene where he is in the um, almost the inf infinitual mirrors I don't know precisely what those, uh, that mirror effect is called, but having him sitting or standing there sort of reflects this 
man who's constantly reflecting himself and, and constantly not liking what he sees and being able to, to look at himself and go, do I like what I see? Do I not like what I see? And I think we know what the answer is. The various motifs and emphasis on reflection um, focus on not only Cain's sense of power and self-importance, but the value of it. And he has this, um, almost this element where he wants to appear powerful, and yet every time he looks in the mirror, he sees this sad little boy still. And so um, the value of this power is ultimately belittled when he looks at himself. And even though he has it all, and he can project it that he has, the, has it all, the moment he looks at himself in the mirror and goes, what have I become? That's when this sort of um, introspective um, haunting of him, of his childhood, of the childhood he lost, sort of comes to the fore a little bit. And herein is the, pretty much the paradox of the film. A man who owns everything and yet has nothing of personal value. Um, and certainly you would think, well, can't wealth buy something of personal value? Well, in this case, no, it can't because the one thing that he tries to buy is a time of his life and he can't buy that. He can't have it in any way, shape or form apart from the fact that he's lost it and he can never have it back again. And this tormented child, the one where he's almost ripped from the arms of his parents, um, suggests a, a, a boy who, or a man who is still a boy who wants to be with mum and dad and playing with a sled in the backyard or in the, in the snow, should I say. And that's pretty much the key idea of the film, is, is knowing this character, this husk of a, of a person who has power, has this ability to um, change the way that people look at things, and yet is still very much empty. And, and certainly, as much as everything he does is, is based on self-interest, and even though he does things which are, I guess, for the good of others, there's still this boy who wants to, and this boy inside of him, who wants to be... Uh, loved by his parents, not sent away, and, and to live a normal and happy life. And ultimately, that is the main starting point for where you should be looking for Citizen Kane. Obviously, the main process now is about dissecting all these various film techniques, um, putting um, emphasis on what you think the most relevant points of the film are, and then start to think about the film in ways where you can are able to compose a response in such a way where you reflect these sorts of ideas. Now, as I mentioned before, it is a simple film to, to talk about and to um, discuss, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can go um, and state the obvious without backing it up with anything. You need to be able to go into depth about these sorts of ideas. So it's something that you need to really make sure that you do when you're looking at this film. And despite, despite its simplicity in terms of um, being able to discuss in, on the technique and informatic level, it still requires you to go into depth and, and to pursue the analysis even deeper and as far as you can go. But otherwise, that's about it for Citizen Kane. Until next time, I'll see you later.